Good morning, and thanks for joining me again as we continue our new lecture series on British female explorers. Last time, uh, we examined the life of an aristocrat, Lady Hest Hester Stanhope, who um, ventured into the Near East and eventually established residence um, in the Lebanon and in Syria. And in so doing, um, forged ties uh, with the local population that would serve the British Empire well in subsequent years. In my write-up of this uh, new lecture series, I mentioned that the women we would be profiling um, were born or came of age during the Victorian or the Edwardian ages. Um, in fact, Lady Stanhope uh, was precedes this period, uh, but she was um, a trailblazer, a pioneer, and I wanted to begin uh, my new lecture series with a discussion of her. But this week, we will be exploring a young woman uh, who was born during uh, the Victorian uh, period and who would venture off to uh, a remote region of the dark continent, West Africa. Now, during this period, uh, many of the great colonial powers of Europe, including England and France and Germany and Holland, were all scrambling, the so-called scramble for Africa, were trying to establish uh, colonial positions in this very valuable uh, continent. Uh, and the British um, already uh, had established a number of trading posts along the uh, coast of uh, West Africa. A number of missionaries had uh, traveled to this uh, region of the world, including um, the famed Scottish uh, missionary, David uh, Livingston. So this week, um, we're gonna be exploring the life of this very uh, remarkable and incredible uh, woman, Mary Kingsley. The lecture entitled, Now Voyager, Mary Kingsley's Travels Through West Africa. So she was born of Mary Henrietta uh, Kingsley in the London Borough of Islington in uh, October of uh, 1862. And um, her parents uh, married just a few days before Mary was actually born in October of that year. Uh, it turns out that um, the mother, Mary Bailey, not to be confused with the uh, fictional character in uh, the famous movie, It's a Wonderful Life, she was the chef of George um, Kingsley. Very interesting. Um, and we'll discuss the mother in just a minute. Uh, but her father, uh, George Kingsley, was a prominent um, physician who uh, lent his services to uh, wealthy aristocrats, including the Earl of Pembroke, uh, George um, Herbert. George K Kingsley uh, was a scientist, a minister, a physician, uh, advocate of Christian uh, socialism, and a well-known uh, progressive of social uh, causes. He was even um, a novelist, and he would go on to uh, write a book uh, called South Sea Bubbles that was a huge bestseller that chronicled his exploits with George Herbert um, in the uh, South Pacific. He was also a Darwinist, so he uh, very much embraced, embraced uh, Charles Darwin's a theory of evolution, and his daughter uh, Mary too would become uh, a Darwinist uh, as well. Before we uh, discuss um, her mother, uh, Mary also had um, famous uncles, um, including Charles uh, Kingsley, who was a well-known um, marine biologist who wrote a fantastic underworld, uh, underwater world. Uh, novel entitled The uh, Water Babies. 
And um, her other uncle, Henry Kingsley, had spent a number of years in, in Australia in search of gold, um, but um, came back uh, disappointed, uh, having not discovered any um, gold fields. So about her mother, um, Mary. Uh, Mary, of course, had been a servant, a chef um, to her father, uh, George King Kingsley, that is uh, Mary Henrietta Kingsley's uh, father. And um, Mary was a recluse, um, constantly sick. We don't know if she suffered any true physical ailments, but she certainly had neurotic um, fits, uh, and she retreated um, to her bedroom. In fact, um, the house uh, was sort of um, something of a prison, not only um, to her mother, Mary Bailey, but also the rest of the family. A lot of the front windows had been uh, bricked in because her mother hated the light. And um, young Mary Henrietta. Uh, would spend her formative years taking care of her invalid uh, mother. No doubt, uh, Mary Bailey felt at a disadvantage. She was not born into prominent society. She um, felt disaffected. She suffered from many bouts of depression when her father went off on, um, that is, when Mary Henrietta's father, George, went off on his many travels um, with um, his sponsors. And so this probably led to, um, you know, mental bouts of depression. And so unfortunately, uh, young Mary's life was very much um, circumscribed. Um, she had to take care of her mother and her younger brother, um, who himself uh, suffered from ill health, her younger brother, um, Charlie. The family, of course, was quite affluent. Um, from uh, Islington, they eventually moved to the upscale neighborhood of Highgate, which is um, not far from uh, Hampstead Heath, um, where uh, quite a few literary people and other famous um, Englishmen uh, dwelled at that time. Um, but, uh, Mary, of course, um, had very little social life, um, very few, very few friends. Uh, she couldn't um, meet a suitor or a husband. And so uh, for now, it looked like her uh, life was already sort of a predestined. Um. So again, um, during her father's absence, her mother, uh, no doubt suffered from a number of uh, mental breakdowns. Um, as her father was venturing off in North America with uh, Lord uh, Dunraven, uh, Thomas Wyndham Quinn, and very interesting um, connection with one of the uh, most important battles in um, the American West, namely the Battle of Little Bighorn. So George, uh, her father had met uh, Colonel George Armstrong uh, Custer uh, while he was in North America with uh, Lord uh, Dunraven. I'm sorry, I forgot to put um, Custer after Armstrong. But in any case, he was almost, uh, he would have been probably uh, dead had he uh, joined up with Custer at the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn in June of uh, 1876, but apparently uh, bad weather prevented him um, from traveling um, to that uh, battle site uh, in June of 1876. In her father's uh, memoirs, um, he was horrified by the ill treatment of the Sioux at the hands of Custer and his men. And this no doubt very much shaped um, the Kingsley's family, Kingsley family's views of British uh, imperialism, imperialism um, in West Africa and in other uh, 
and other parts of the uh, uh, British um, Empire. Um, as I mentioned, um, her father uh, wrote a number of articles, but he's uh, best known for his uh, famous travel adventure book, uh, South Sea Bubbles, which was published uh, in 1872. So like many other Victorian girls at the time, young Mary uh, never went to school, um, very little tutoring um, in the home, but she did have access to her father's amazing private library that included many works on geography, uh, travel narratives, uh, natural history, the writings of uh, Sir Richard Burton and his um, famous uh, sojourns um, in the Middle East and his uh, travels to Mecca, etc. She was not interested in um, the works of Jane Austen or uh, Charlotte and uh, Emily Bronte, but she just devoured her uh, father's books on science and natural history and all these famous uh, travel uh, memoirs. And so she became self taught. And she learned uh, much about the uh, tribes of Western Africa. Her father was very much interested in the ancient, ancient ritualistic uh, practices of the uh, people of West Africa, um, especially fetishes, which are the ancient tribal rituals um, uh, of, of many of these indigenous people. In addition um, to the books in her father's library, she was fascinated by many of the um, curiosities that he had brought back from remote regions of the world, um, artifacts of Native American Indians in North America, uh, artifacts from Polynesia, artifacts from uh, Africa, um, et cetera. So uh, Mary, as I mentioned, was largely um, self-taught, but her father did encourage her to learn German. Uh, at that time, of course, um, most of these scientific journals, other treatises were published in uh, German. And um, she became essentially her father's right-hand man as a uh, research uh, assistant. So Mary indeed lived a, a very cloistered life. Um, she once wrote, the whole of my childhood and youth was spent at home in the house and the garden. The living outside world, I saw little of, little of and cared less for. The truth was I had a great amusing world of my own that other people did not know or care about. And that was the books in my father's library. So she, imagined these far-flung places um, in West Africa and thought that perhaps she too someday might visit uh, these far-flung places. Now things began um, to change. The world began to open up for Mary when her family uh, moved to uh, Cambridge in 1886. Her brother um, would be attending uh, Cambridge uh, to study uh, law. And although um, Mary herself would not be uh, admitted to any of the uh, colleges, the famed gates, as they were called, uh, at Cambridge, um, she did uh, study German uh, and she took courses uh, in nursing and medicine that would serve her very well once um, she traveled uh, through West Africa. Now, Mary um, was much more gifted academically than her brother, um, Charlie, who was studying uh, law, as I just mentioned. But she did have an opportunity to uh, mingle in the social and intellectual uh, circles of her brother. And she did meet a young man by the name of Henry um, Gimar, um, who would eventually uh, become one of her uh, editors. Now, tragedy um, struck the Kingsley family uh, in 1892. Her father had been uh, suffering from a rheumatic fever. He was bedridden in February of that year, 
he passed away. And just a few months later, her mother did as well. So although she mourned the death of her parents and she had very close relationship with her father and she did indeed um, love her ailing mother, but now she felt uh, free, liberated as it were. Uh, and the father had left um, a sizable estate for the kids of about 8,600 pounds, which doesn't sound a lot. They also inherited um, the family's land holdings, but the money which was split um, into would now allow her um, to travel. So now um, these uh, sort of her vicarious travel would now um, become a reality. And we find her just a few weeks later setting off on her first trip to Africa. Um, now, Mary had um, only ventured outside England once, a, a family trip to Paris in uh, 1888 with, um, with one of her uh, family's uh, acquaintances. But just six weeks after her mother's uh, passing, Mary, who wasn't quite yet 30 years of age, decided to go on a trip to the uh, Canary Islands, which were located about 100 miles from the uh, African coast. But this is where she could make contact um, with uh, ship's captains uh, and traders who uh, did business with various uh, tribes on the West African uh, mainland. And she would present herself as a trader. This would be the, this was her entree into this remote uh, part of the world. Um, it would allow her legitimacy. It would allow her to learn about the local peach people um, of West Africa. And, it would earn her um, some uh, needed money um, for her uh, ventures um, into uh, West Africa. So uh, many of these European uh, traders um, told her about uh, the culture of the West African people. She heard of stories of cannibalism and um, the various exotic ecosystems. She was uh, very much interested in recording uh, the finding of various new uh, specimens of fish and insects. So, and she would also become a amateur uh, ethnographer, but more and more her limited training as an uh, amateur uh, anthropologist would serve her well and sort of presenting her credentials, if you will, as a, as a scientist. Now, this um, brief trip, uh, on this brief trip to the Canaries, she went to the island of uh, Gomera, a famous volcanic island, and tells how she slept in one of the uh, volcanic uh, craters. Um, she wrote how traders spent most of their time going to and from uh, the west coast of Africa. Um, they carried uh, sperm candle, saltpeter, uh, and then returned with uh, monkeys, parrots, snakes, um, et cetera. But again, she learned uh, much about the trading activity um, in this region of the world. And so she herself, um, on subsequent trips to Africa, would present um, herself as a, a trader. During this early period, she also began um, to develop um, her opinions regarding um, missionaries, and she had a very um, negative view of missionaries um, who were proselytizing in this region of the world. More about that later. So she returned to um, London in December of 1892, and she discovered that her brother had um, taken a top floor apartment in London, which she didn't like at all. And so she decided that as soon as she um, had 
enough resources saved, uh, she would return to Africa. And her primary purpose was to uh, finish the scientific book of her father on West African uh, culture. Now, he had been um, studying for many years um, many of the fetish practices of uh, the indigenous peoples of West Africa. So again, fetishes is the um, study uh, of various ritualistic uh, practices, especially religion and law. Um, fetishes deals, of course, with the way um, in which the spirit world can communicate with materialistic um, objects. So um, she turned to the British uh, Museum of Natural um, History and uh, one of the uh, scholars at, uh, at the British Museum, a zoologist by the name of Albert Gunter, would um, become one of her uh, mentors and outfit her with the so-called collector's outfit that included uh, nets and uh, various jars and the types of liquids, um, you know, the chemicals that were necessary to preserve insects and fish. Um, so on the one hand, she would go as a trader, but um, during her forays into West Africa, she would fashion herself as a scientist, um, as a cultural anthropologist, and as a scientist ethnographer who would collect um, important specimens um, during her journeys. Now, except for um, the wives of missionaries, the ideal of, of a proper Victorian woman to venture off on her own was virtually unthinkable. unthinkable. So her friends uh, really um, encouraged her uh, not to go because at that time, Africa was considered um, the white man's grave. Uh, many reports of missionaries um, never uh, returning. So uh, before she uh, ventured off, um, the following year, she uh, did uh, make out her will. So um, as I just mentioned, the idea of an unprotected, proper upper-class uh, woman um, venturing to this um, dangerous remote region of, of Africa was almost unthinkable, but there were a few exceptions. And uh, one was um, the uh, famous uh, biologist and uh, famed artist of botanical drawings, uh, Marion uh, North, whom you see here. Um, she was affiliated with the uh, Royal Botanic Society um, located at Kew, the Royal Botanical Gardens outside of, uh, outside of London. If you go there today, there's this fabulous gallery that's completely decorated with her amazing Bot botanical uh, uh, paintings. I encourage you next time, if you have a chance to go to Kew Gardens um, to visit this uh, famous uh, venue. So um, Mary herself would um, see herself as a self-taught um, anthropologist and scientist collecting fish and insects uh, specimens um, for the uh, British uh, Museum. Um, as she ventured off once again uh, to Africa. So I should mention something about her um, Victorian attire. So uh, virtually all the photographs that we see of Mary Kingsley show her in this sort of proper uh, stiff Victorian attire that um, consisted of black skirts uh, and blouses and high button shoes, quite a contrast with Lady Stanhope who would assume the exotic attire of the, uh, of the Middle East. She said though that she was not an explorer um, in petticoats, but this was, this 
her outfit became sort of her signature, sort of trademark. Of course, totally um, unsuitable for the hot, humid uh, African climate. We also know that she um, carried a knife and a revolver, but as far as we know from her memoirs and um, other first-hand accounts, she never actually had to um, use them. Instead, she would rely on her own wits um, and self-confidence as well as her thorough knowledge of um, local cover uh, um, culture. So in her book, um, her most famous book, um, which was published in 1898, Travels in uh, West Africa, she said, you have no right to go about Africa and things you would be ashamed to be seen in at home. So um, in the summer of 1893, she made her next voyage to, to uh, Africa and she um, arrived at the port of Freetown in Sierra Leone uh, in, <coughs> on the 17th of August um, in 1893. And she writes how she um, lived among the local uh, inhabitants who taught her some necessary skills for surviving in the African jungles. And we know that she made a uh, a number of voyages upriver um, before she uh, continued on aboard a Portuguese mail boat called the Lagos, which sailed down um, the coast of Africa, finally um, arriving in um, Cabinda, which was a port city in Angola. Um, that allowed access to the uh, Congo River. Many of the uh, sailors aboard the Lagos thought she was a missionary or a botanist um, who had been maybe sent from the Royal Botanical Society to examine and discover many of the uh, flora and fauna of the region. But she announced uh, once she arrived in Cabinda that she was a trader from the firm of Hatson and Cookson. And to prove that, she brought fish hooks and tobacco and standard cloth that she could exchange for ivory and rubber. So. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it was important to present herself with these sort of trading um, credentials that would allow her to enter into native villages, establish bonds and relationships with the locals who in turn would inform her about um, the hinterland and provide her with sort of the necessary survival skills um, when she made her way um, inland. So as I mentioned earlier, she had uh, read widely on the new science of anthropology and um, also on physical sciences um, because she really wanted, she really saw herself as sort of coming out of the uh, Cambridge uh, mold. She very much um, eschewed many of the intellectual uh, treatises on anthropology and ethnology. And whereas um, many of the academics never ventured outside of England, she said, if you want to become a credible uh, anthropologist or ethnographer, you have to go out into the field. And that is, of course, one of her great contributions as a pioneer anthropologist actually working in the field of West Africa. So um, here is a map. Um, here is Freetown, the port of uh, Sierra Leone. Um, this would have given, uh, this was sort of the entry into the Niger uh, river system. Here's Liberia, the Cote d'Ivoire, 
the Slave Coast, and then um, on to uh, the port of Cabinda down here. Here is Calabar, um, entry way into uh, Nigeria. But uh, from Cabinda, you would enter into the French Congo, present day um, Gabon. So um, as I mentioned, uh, many of the Europeans she encountered thought she was either a missionary or a botanist, but in fact, she told them, um, I'm a trader, but I'm also on a scientific expedition from uh, the British Museum in order to collect um, fish specimens. So she said, I am in search of fish and uh, fetishes. Again, uh, fetish, fetishes being uh, the religious rituals of various native tribes in which um, spiritual powers could communicate with uh, material uh, objects. We know that um, she slept in the same hut as that of Henry Morton Stanley, who was in search of the Scottish uh, missionary, uh, David uh, Livingston. Um, she stayed with um, the traders of this region for a couple of weeks, and um, they were uh, they fell in love with her and called her Auntie. Uh, and then she made her uh, perilous five-month trip up the Congo River as a researcher as well as a trader, and this would help her. Um, gain acceptance with uh, many of the uh, local um, inhabitants. She mentions in her travels in West Africa, I bought some elephant hair necklaces from one of the chief's wives by exchanging my red silk tie with that she had um, for these uh, for the elephant hair uh, necklace, necklaces. Again, um, these were important forays um, in which she acquired uh, much information about uh, local uh, practices um, that she would write about. And as a trader, she could, of course, um, underwrite uh, further uh, adventures into the uh, hinterland of uh, West Africa. So um, back in Af back in uh, England, um, she remarked that you know this wasn't some sort of capriciousness or some sort of stupid um, sort of escapist uh, avocation, but really sort of a respectable pastime for a middle class um, spinster. So she saw her work of collecting. Uh, fish and beetles and plants as very important work on behalf of the uh, British uh, Museum. Now, I mentioned um, she had earned the respect of a very famous zoologist by the name of Albert uh, Gunther, who um, gave her um, the necessary material, material for her to um, collect uh, specimens um, in uh, West Africa. And um, she would now venture off again um, a year later at the very end of, dis very end of uh, 1894. But uh, this time with Lady Ethel MacDonald, um, who was the wife of Sir Claude MacDonald at that time the first commissioner and consul general, general of the Niger Coast um, Protectorate. And um, this time she would travel in style um, with this woman of uh, privilege. And uh, they would make their way uh, to Calabar, which was the site of the colonial government uh, in this region. And um, I mentioned um, she had for the most part, a very negative opinion of, of missionaries, but she did become friends with one Mary 
Slesser, who had already been a missionary in this region for nearly 20 years. That's quite remarkable because uh, most missionaries um, barely live beyond three to five years. So Mary Slesser became um, one of her um, companions and Mary Slesser um, had uh, observed and studied many of the fetishes of the region. And one fetish that she want to, wanted to stamp out was the fetish of twin killing in which one twin that was born was believed to be born of the devil because it was believed that the mother had actually slept with the um, devil. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Mary had a remarkable gift to learn about um, disparate cultures, foreign people, foreign inhabitants. She believed that we belong to that same section of the human race with whom it is better to drink rather than to uh, fight. Mary felt a, a kindred spirit with the uh, African uh, natives um, and was able to establish, um, in many respects, stronger ties with uh, the various tribes people um, she encountered on her travels. On this second trip to Africa, she would canoe up the Ogawi River, which ran through the uh, French Congo, again, present day uh, uh, Gabon. In fact, um, she was taught how to canoe as a native and she regarded that as one of the greatest skills um, she acquired while uh, in Africa. Now, she wanted to uh, venture up the Ogawa River um, in search of a uh, new uh, fish specimen, um, etc. And um, she also uh, was very interested in learning about uh, tribes that practiced uh, cannibalism. Eventually, um, she did encounter the notorious Fang tribe, which were known to be uh, cannibals. Um, as far as she knew, only one European, a Frenchman, had visited the Fang, but um, never returned, and there was no trace of, of him. She enlisted um, the help of some local tribes, including the Ajumba and the Igalwe. And when she arrived at the principal outpost of the Fang, um, they ran down with weapons and they were uh, about to kill her. But uh, fortunately, one of the Fang recognized uh, one of the members of her party who had uh, traded with the Fang in the past. Um, eventually, Mary would really develop close ties with the Fang and even a mutual respect as she described a certain sort of friendship soon arose between the Fang and me. Sometimes uh, she spells Fangs without the G. We each recognize that we belong as to that same section of the human race with whom it is better to drink than to fight, as I think I mentioned um, before. She also encountered a number of other dangers on her river trip um, up the Agawa. We um, know that she encountered a crocodile as she described, I had to click, clip him on the snout uh, with a paddle. Um, quite a few of um, deadly um, insects. We know that she uh, nursed a number of tribesmen who were suffering from um, various um, infections and maladies. And again, her study in nursing and medicine would serve her well uh, among the tribes of West Africa. She also um, remarks how she slept on an island um, with a hippopotamus. She also became famous 
for scaling the famous Mount Cameroon um, over 13,750 feet in height, the first woman to scale it, and she and her party were the first to ascend it from a different um, route. Here's a, a map of her uh, ventures in uh, Gabon. We know that she traveled some 70 miles on foot between the Ogawa River and the uh, Gabon River. And um, many of the villagers uh, were hostile, but she had hired uh, an interpreter um, to help um, facilitate. At one point, uh, one village um, were ready to uh, kill her, kill her and her party. But the uh, she told she told the interpreter to tell them, "We have just landed in a village of thieves and." The thief, um, horrified, uh, was horrified, and she told him that yes, um, that if she did not announce to her, her his villagers that they were living in a village of thieves, that she would. Chief was altogether dumbfounded by her bravado, and protested that it was indeed. Um, a good place. Eventually, they were able to establish um, a friendly uh, relationship and um, she moved on. But again, these um, perilous uh, journeys um, uh, really were quite amazing when you think about um, this uh, proper Victorian woman who really sort of, although she, you could you know, she clearly presented herself as this uh, upper class Victorian woman. In many ways, um, she sort of took, it was necessary for her to take on more of a, a male um, persona uh, in order to um, survive. Here's a, a number of maps. So you can see again, here's a Cabinda, here's the Ogawa River. Um, here again is the coast of West Africa, so Cabinda, present day Angola. These are her uh, ventures up the uh, Ogawa River, um, et cetera. Here is a um, photograph of her traveling aboard a canoe uh, up the Ogawa uh, River basin. Um, here is a view of her trek. 70 mile trek, very lush farmland, as you can uh, see in this uh, part of West Africa. Here's an image of the uh, Feng people, uh, yes, um, noted as uh, cannibals. So uh, Mary returned home to London in triumph in uh, November of uh, 18. 95, a lot of fanfare. Uh, many journalists wanted to uh, interview her. And um, over the next three years, she would um, become a very controversial uh, figure on a number of issues. So at the time, of course, the uh, suffragette movement uh, in England was fully underway, as we um, discussed in uh, previous. Um, lectures. She very much hated the idea of being labeled a new woman or feminist, um, as though she was a champion of the uh, suffrage uh, movement. And for this, um, she got a lot of uh, controversy. She altogether rejected uh, the suffragette movement, despite her own incursions into the male preserves of exploration, trading, and uh, uh, political debate. So there's some um, controversy as to why, what, what were some of the reasons why she did not identify with the suffragette movement? One of the reasons is that she thought it would ruin her, the credibility she had uh, in securing rights for uh, 
West African uh, traders. She even argued that the women's suffrage movement should be put on the back burner until more attention was given to the still disenfranchised men of the uh, United Kingdom. So she went on the uh, lecture worker uh, circuit um, in order to earn money to underwrite further trips um, to uh, Africa. And she published um, two works, as I mentioned, uh, Travels in West Africa. That was a huge, huge hit um, as a travelogue, again, chronicling the many adventures of a proper Victorian woman into the heart of West Africa. Uh, and a more scholarly work that was quite well received by the scientific and scholarly community published in uh, 1899, West African uh, Studies. So she really received a lot of uh, negative press uh, and the enmity of the Church of England regarding her view of uh, missionaries. Now, as we've seen, Mary's interest in, Mary had great interest in and respect for the local West African cultures, quite unusual for the time. Many Brits considered Africans to be, quote unquote, savages, very much in need of Christianity. They had to be proselytized in order to civ in order to civilize them. But Mary denounced missionaries for destroying the indigenous cultures and disrespecting the people of West Africa. There is, um, has been a lot of discussion regarding her own religious beliefs. Of course, she had been baptized in the uh, Anglican Church, and she did believe that Christianity did have a role in bringing sort of moral value system to the animist cultures of uh, West Africa, but she didn't like describing herself as a Christian per se. Oftentimes, she would not use the word God, but Allah, she believed that actually Islam had um, better success at, as a religion in this um, region uh, of the world. She kind of saw herself as a deist and a Darwinist, um, sometimes even an agnostic. So um, as regards um, her religious value system, that is still um, uh, open um, to debate. A lot of discussion regarding to what extent um, she even regarded herself as a Christian. She defended many aspects of African life that shocked many proper English people, especially um, polygamy, which um, she did champion. She really believed that the missionary insistence on monogamy really undermined the uh, institutions of many of these uh, African tribes. Her view on colonialism and British imperialism has also been the subject of debate. She herself saw herself as sort of an old fashioned imperialist. She herself had not, had, did not view askance on British imperialism. Um, what she was troubled with was the way colonial power was exercised or administered. From her ethnographical findings, she saw the Africans she met as inhabiting a world that was so different 
from uh, Westerners and that if uh, British imperialism was to take root, it was absolutely necessary for British officials to totally immerse themselves into the culture of the region in order for her British counterparts to really understand the true nature of these indigenous people. In the end, she thought that Britain did have the right to locate new trading markets, and she herself did not oppose colonization per se, but the more she entered into um, Western Africa, the more she realized, well, perhaps British colonials, colonialism should not take root in this um, part of the world. She did not lack a sense of Anglo-Saxon superiority, but inclined to attribute this to cultural differences, not to inherently racial factors. So again, her views on British imperialism to this day remain uh, quite controversial. In many ways, she was a Dar Darwinist and she believed that British, the British imperialism should be somewhat paternalistic um, in its approach, in, a, in its indirect approach to ruling tribes of Africa. She believed only through British culture could, as she described, African people be completed. Again, that sounds um, extremely racist, um, but she did, um, as I mentioned, really share in many ways, this sort of view, this imperialistic view over a uh, third world. So um, almost five years would pass before Mary would return to Africa, but this time not to West um, Africa. Um, she wanted to become a war correspondent during um, the Second Boer War in uh, South Africa. Um, eventually, she um, abandoned this no, no, um, notion of becoming um, a correspondent on the front during the height of the Second Boer War. Instead, she volunteered as a nurse. Remember, she had uh, received training um, in medicine while at Cambridge. And um, in order to show her sort of sort of uh, qualms about British imperialism, she did not minister to, Brit to her British countrymen who had been injured, but rather to the Boer prisoners of war who had been um, captured uh, by uh, the British. Many of them um, came down with typhoid fever, and uh, she herself would succumb to typhoid only about three months after her arrival, when she died on the 3rd of June in um, 1900. Um, she, accord she wanted to die alone in a room like a wounded animal who had gone off to die. And um, her wishes were that she would be um, buried at sea, which she was with full military honors, um, somewhat comical at her burial at sea when her coffin was thrown into the water, um, it didn't sink. So it had to be um, retrieved. And then an anchor was placed in her coffin to assure that um, it would sink. Um, she was only 37 when she uh, passed away. Um, and the, back at home, there was absolute shock. The fact that this 
Florence Nightingale, um, as it were, um, had died. A lot of tribute in the newspapers, but um, a lot of criticism um, as well. But Mary would go on to being hailed as a great anthropologist, as a great um, ethnographer. Some three fish were named um, in her honor. More than anything else, she wanted to be remembered as, as a Victorian woman who had gone native, someone who had really immersed herself into the life of the peoples of uh, West Africa. As I mentioned, um, among the two things she prided most was that she knew how to paddle as a local and that she had become a reputable scientist who had discovered new specimens um, of fish and had done much to make um, British anthropologists back at home better acquainted uh, with the peoples of West Africa. And she felt that she had done well in preserving the legacy of her father and completing his work. Um, just a year before she died, she wrote, it is merely that I have the power of bringing out in my fellow creatures, white or black, their virtues in a way honorable to them and fortunate for me. So next week, um, we'll examine uh, another um, remarkable life. Um, again, we'll return um, to the Middle East. I hope all of you are well and hope you try to stay cool in this um, very hot weather. Uh, look forward to seeing you all um, next week.